On Design today, we have my friend and local contributor to the UX community, Jeff Carter. This guy is just a plethora of knowledge, and I was really excited to get him on the show and share some of these insights. Our topic is about personal branding. How can you really drive home your own brand and let your personality shine both pre-interview and post-interview? How can you really help somebody understand what you're all about in a unique and genuine way? We look at things like portfolios and your case studies and how you present your work. Uh, he gives some feedback and some thoughts on how to present those case studies just so that they don't look like everyone else's. How can we really make ourselves look hireable and desirable by those who are interviewing us? How can we bring our personality to shine in that interview process? Jeff's got some thoughts, so let's take a peek at it today. This is Design Today featuring Jeff Carter. Here we go. Jeff. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thanks for having me. I uh, have been looking forward, actually, to getting you on the show. Your name has been on my whiteboard now for some time. Ooh. And uh, I'm uh, excited to finally get around to uh, to having you here. We've uh, had some overlap just via the local community stuff. Yep. I've seen you participate in different conversations. I've seen... Uh, you know, I guess what you've contributed to the community. And I thought uh, there's not a better person to come on the show and, and talk about what we've got set up to talk about uh, other than you. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you letting me come on. Yeah. Uh, before we get going into the topic, I do want to give you a chance to introduce yourself uh, yep. and tell us a little bit about what uh, you're doing here at Rise Point, And uh, we'll then jump into the conversation here. Yeah, so work for, at Rise Point with I'm their uh, director of UX. Mm -hmm. We've got a small team, small company of 46. So we actually run across the whole company. So between product and our marketing team, I'm kind of over both of those. Interesting. And get to kind of lead UX from both the product and our marketing, our, our different touch points for our employees. So it's kind of a fun experience to hire designers to fill those needs across the whole board not just in product yeah so you get a lot of variety then what you're doing yep lots of variety from journey maps and straight research all the way to pretty visuals for <laughs> trade booths so, yeah that's interesting yep. uh, and how many people do you have on your team designers yeah so right now the word designer might be loose so we okay. actually have a web developer who okay. also designs and develops for our marketing sure. we have a creative director who okay. does most of the design on marketing and then myself and a design intern for now cool and the intern uh we both know him you, you've yep. got a good guy on board there yeah um where were you at before rise point at rise point i've been a couple different local companies uh one being in contact which is a fairly big company 1200 people and then a company most people know called workfront or okay. before it was at task okay cool yep and so you've been doing ux professionally for how long now Oh man, depends what your definition of UX is. <laughs> That's true. But I started web design. That's true. Clear back in 2004, 2003. Yeah. So it's been a while. And so you've been through the process of the job titles just evolving throughout the years and oh, changing. Man. I think I've had every job title <laughs> from web designer, UI designer, interaction designer, UX. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah, my brother who uh, who's actually been on the show before, he's a transplant from San Diego area. Yeah, uh, he's been doing graphic design now for twenty some years, and oh wow, uh, you know he's just kind of hung into that job title. But I'm like, man, you could apply for any of these UX jobs. I mean, he's talented and he yep. could he knows the design process forwards and backwards because, you know, process really hasn't changed. Nope. <laughs> uh, it's just kind of been given more name and structure. But I go, just change your title to UX and man, you could be killing it here in, in uh, the this product community. But, uh, yeah. you know, he likes doing some of the more traditional marketing design and advertising design and that kind of stuff as well. So, yeah. Good to find those people. They're hard to find. Well, but there's few jobs. So, I mean, he's really had to, do, he's had to do a lot of digging to keep himself uh, to keep himself busy, but he's landed a good spot now. Good. Um, so I wanted to 
chat with you about uh, something that I think a lot of designers who are preparing themselves for a career uh, have got on their mind, which is how do I prepare my portfolio? Yep. And being that you've done a fair amount of hiring over the years, uh, even recently with uh, an intern at Rise Point, yep. I wanted to get your take on portfolios and really dive into what are the things that you're looking for? What are the things you're uh, hoping to see? Um, and, and just kind of jump into that. So yep. tell me just real quick, the most uh, recent portfolio you looked at, thumbs up or th- thumbs down? Oh boy, the most recent. Uh, it was a good one. It was a good one. Yep. What made it a good one? So one of the, the main rules that I always look for in a portfolio is the scannability. Mm-hmm. So when you think uh, from a graphic design, I'm going to give an example that I don't know if I remember everything because I actually come from an industrial design background. Okay. But uh, some of the graphic design courses I took, I remember my professor always talking about what's the 10 foot read uh-huh. of a poster, then what's the three foot read of a poster and what's the one foot. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of that idea of drawing you once to look at it, yeah. make them come a little bit closer. And you think, how many portfolios do the same? Do, do they have that 10 foot where I can easily scan it and say, OK, I know enough about this person. I'm interested in moving forward. Mm-hmm. And then I might read more details and then mm-hmm. more details. And so I think the portfolios that tend to stand out are those ones that instantly suck me in. And I say, I got to know more about this. And is it a pretty thing or what is it that catches your attention? So what do you think grabs your attention at the 10 feet? You know, what is it that you see that you go like, Oh, I want to know more about that. Yeah. So anytime I look at something, I say, do I instantly know what that visual element is? Uh huh. I uh, want the beauty of the old portfolios is one you'd have the page view, right? Uh-huh. So one page, it would say, here's our, my problem statement. Here's the next page. And it was me going on site to do user research. The next one was, here's me doing card sorting. The next was, here's wireframing. Here's a user model. Yeah. And you could easily scan through and know what steps they took without having to read any title headers or uh-huh. anything because you had nice visuals. So when I look at portfolios and I can almost do that same scan, it's really great because I can say, oh, they went on site mm-hmm. to a customer or they did online uh, usability testing mm-hmm. or here's where they did icons. Yeah. So once you get drawn into a project uh, and you start looking at maybe their process, yep. uh, what are things that you like to see? Maybe someone who's applying for an internship or an associate position. What are some of the things you like to see that they've they can already demonstrate in their portfolio? My biggest thing is how curious were they? Uh huh. So too many times I, th- I think projects we try and say, here's the problem, here's the one solution I did, and it was awesome. Uh huh. Where I almost love to see when somebody messed up. Oh like, yes, yes. Keep going. Right? Like how many times have have we? avoided putting mistakes in there because we don't want to look bad but how many times as designers do we mess up yeah we come up with this awesome design we put it in front of a user and they say i don't understand this yeah but we forget to document those yeah so i actually love when there's a little bit of that exploration and you show me where you messed up and i say messed up but didn't come up with the right solution yeah because it happens all the time we all deal with it and then showing how you overcame that problem is huge for me. So going back to the, when you found yourself maybe making a mistake in it, are you okay with them making a mistake? I need people that make mistakes and know how to overcome it. Because I was just having a conversation. This is gonna be a shout out. I don't know if you know the name, Jake Otteson. Mm-hmm. Um, great designer. I mean, he's gonna have a great career ahead of him. Yep. And one of the things that uh, he and I were just doing like a, a mock interview the other day, he's preparing for, actually it was probably last week, he had an interview with IBM. Okay. And he was doing uh, his presentation with me online, just like you would be doing with IBM. Yeah. And as he was taking me through it, he did a lot of good things. But the thing that really stood out to me is he got to a certain spot. And I think in his wireframes, he was going, I chose this design. Um, hindsight, I wish I wouldn't have. Yeah. Uh, hindsight, I wish I would have chosen this for this reason. I think this scales better. And I think the solution I went with just didn't end up working the way I hoped it would. Yeah. And I, as I was taking notes through, I was just like round of applause because there's nothing wrong with that. Oh yeah. I love, love, love going back to the curiosity thing. And I don't know if it's a humility thing or ego thing. 
it's okay to be wrong. Yep. I'm not hiring you to have all the answers. Yeah. I'm hiring you to, hiring you to help me discover the answers. And as long as we're doing that, we're succeeding. Yeah. And so he, he documented in this, again, just exactly what you're saying. Here's what I did. I was a little bit off. I wish I would have done this. And I think that is so important when we're documenting these things for our portfolio and getting oh, yeah. into the interviews. And if you can show me that you did that earlier in the process as well, yeah. I think that's a huge part of it mm-hmm. because then I can see you didn't go through the whole process and get to your final visual and then show somebody Very and you sure. failed. Yep. I would love to see someone on the early wireframe, show me 10 of them mm-hmm. and that this one failed, this one failed, this one failed, and we finally had a good one. Yeah. I think, I think one of the fears that... Uh, new designers have and showing like where they were wrong is they don't want those who are interviewing them to end up having like this buyer's remorse. You know, if, if somebody's interviewing with Jeff Carter, they're going, man, this guy's good. And he really knows what he's (laughs) talking about. And I don't want him to feel like I'm an idiot. So I can't show that I'm wrong, Yep. but it is the opposite. I mean, I've said that multiple times. I want to hear your take on that. And if, if you really do believe that. Oh, I, Yeah, I totally feel that people who can admit when they were wrong or made a mistake and know how to move forward are going to be the best collaborators. So you think of any relationship, if you think about if you and your wife or you and your spouse got into an argument because Mm -hmm. you did something wrong and you sat there and said, nope, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. That relationship's not going to (laughs) last. And it's the same with a designer to a director. Yeah, If you can't go in there and say... I did this and I messed up. Let's mm-hmm. we got to figure out how to move forward or we need to change development process or we need to do something because this interaction didn't work. Yeah. If you can't have that, the product's going to suffer, the um maybe your relationships and the team's going to suffer. There's always yeah. a lot of I messed up. How do we fix it and let's move forward? Yeah. You know, so that kind of gets into you said you're 10 foot, you're three foot and you're one foot, right? Yep. Um, that really gets into the weeds of when you're looking at it up close, you're going through some of like their, their documentation or whatever. Uh, but if I back up a second, uh, you, you kind of came up with this spoke analogy last time we were talking. Yep. Uh, what a portfolio should be and consist of and the difference between maybe a portfolio and a case study. Uh, do you mind uh, speaking to, I guess, that metaphor of the spoke? Yeah. So what I think is interesting is two of the words that we really focus and almost say are the same, which are actually completely different as a portfolio and a case study. Right. So if we get out of the visual design world and go straight to what a, a portfolio was, is it was a collection of all sorts of assets. So you think of your investment, you have a portfolio that ranges across a whole bunch of different things. But a case study before you actually got into it was, hey, I did this. I had this problem. This is how I solved it so that other people could read it and be able to apply that to their work. Mm -hmm. So if someone solved something in a creative way, that's what a case study was. Mm -hmm. It was a study so that people could understand how Mm -hmm. to apply it. Well, somehow we've turned that into uh, the replacement for a portfolio. But if we go back to like the true definitions, if a portfolio is that true hub of something yeah. and a case study is something to support that, then we can start looking at all the other assets that we create that strengthen a portfolio. So if the portfolio is that hub, then a spoke might be a case study. Uh-huh. It might be a prototype. It might be a dribble account that uh-huh. shows all your visual design. You can start having all these other areas that support that portfolio instead of trying to replace the portfolio. Yeah. Uh, as a hiring manager, are there any one of those spokes that you just mentioned that you give more weight to? Oh, that's a good question. I actually give the least weight to case studies. Interesting. Why is that? If you can show me a prototype of how something worked, that instantly shows me that you can get in front of a user, you can get in front of a developer, show them how something should work. Or if you did a prototype, I'm guessing you didn't just make it for fun, Yeah. that you probably got it in front of somebody. Uh, Dribble, I actually really love that because at Rice Point, we look for individuals who can really render their intent. So whether yeah. that's the research, like you think of how much research you gather. And if you can't boil that down to a nice 
presentation mm-hmm. for a CEO or for a development team. They have might have no clue what you're yeah. doing. Okay. So to me, I want to see those things. And then I'll ask you about what's in a case study. How much time when uh, you've got applicants for a position and they send you their portfolio, how much time do you spend reading uh, their case studies? I hope I hopefully nobody's listening to this. <laughs> Almost zero. Really? So we hire interns every quarter. Uh-huh. So every three months we get a fresh intern. And I last one got 90 applicants. The one before that we got 104 and the one before 116. So you think how much time is a director willing to spend reading case studies when they have that many? Right. So the first always becomes the scan. The next So then I pare that down to a certain amount. And for me, I'm not going to read it. I'd rather get on the phone and hear how you talk about what you've done. Um, So even my current intern came and asked me, so what did you think of my portfolio? And I said, I don't even know what's in your portfolio. (laughs) And that makes me sound really bad as a director that I didn't do my job. But in reality... I wanted to quickly scan it, Yeah, understand he did research, he did an interaction model, he did uh, the final visual. Great, I'm getting this guy on the phone mm-hmm. and I want him to tell the story instead of me read the story. Sure. Because if they can't, if they can't communicate, I don't want them to work for me. I need them to be able to get up, present to the company, present to the rest of the team, yeah. their ideas, the way they solved it. So actually, that's why I, I, the case studies, I don't put a lot of time into them yeah. because I want them to tell me, not me read it and make yeah. a hiring decision based off of that. Because you want them to present to you. Yep. You know, it's funny if uh, for those who are listening, who've been following along over you know, the last couple of months, I've talked about the soft skills uh, that UX designers need and how important they are. I do believe hard skills are important, but I do feel that the hard skills are it's a baseline. It's a bare minimum. Uh, the next step, if you want to separate yourself, is those soft skills. Yep. Anyone. And I say anyone with an asterisk, anyone can create a case study. Yep. But can you present that case study? Because that skill is going to be essential when I get you on the job. Yeah. So you've got a couple case studies. Uh, you said you had a, how many applicants for this last round? It was somewhere between 90 and 96. I don't remember the exact And you number. whittled it down to how big of a group? Probably on this one around 8 to 10. And how did you go from 90 to 8 to 10? Uh, maybe the worst way. I... The first thing I do is look at their resume. Uh Does it look like a designer did it or does it look like Word did it? Okay. If Word did it, instantly out. Interesting. Probably lose some good designers that way, but it also shows me how much time did you put into it. Yeah. If the the resume looks good, I move on to whatever their portfolio is. Most of the time now it ends up being medium articles and I give them 30 seconds. Pull the first one or the one article looks most interesting. Do a scan down. If that looks pretty good, I put them in the A list. If it looks okay, put them in the B list. If it looks bad, they're gone. If uh, they didn't have a medium account, let's say they have their own website. Yep. Any sort of weight or that you give someone who's put together a website as opposed to just a medium account? That's a good question. I'm trying to think. I don't think I've ever considered one better than the other because I realize it's the execution of the medium you have and medium is the bad word yeah, I know what medium you're in the old way yeah, yeah. <laughs> is if you can properly lay out in medium yeah. something that looks nice great go for it if you don't know how to either code your own website or use like webflow to lay something mm-hmm. out I'm not going to hold that against you because my job I'm not going to make you do that ever sure um, so I don't know if I ever consider either better as long as you've laid it out in a way that presents the information well. Yeah, that's. I think that's fair. I was going to say that I probably do put more weight on those who've prepared a website for a couple of reasons. But I think my reasoning was going to be is I want to see this brand that you've created for yourself. Yep. And I want to see how consistent you held to that brand. Yeah. And how you presented yourself. Because next I'm going to ask you to, pre, you know, represent our company or our business or whatever. And I yeah. want to see how well you, you can see that outside of just... You know, the the medium, which is a glorified word doc, right? It's true. So I thought I did put more weight into the website, but based off of what you said, you can see similar things in a medium account. You mm-hmm. can see how well they adhered to their own brand or how, how well they adhered to um, 
organization and that kind of stuff on a medium account. I guess it's fair. You could do that. Well, and what's interesting is a lot of people don't use medium in ways that could be very intentional. So you think of most medium articles you read that put an image at the top, Mm -hmm. they just go into unsplash and pull some random Mm -hmm. image. Let that be like the title page to your, that portfolio or mm-hmm. to that case study. Mm-hmm. Make it nice. Put some nice typography mm-hmm. and then make each article start with an, a well-crafted um, visual. Mm-hmm. To your point, now all of a sudden your brand is a slap right at the top of each of those pages. How do you – I mean at this point in time when you're, you've are you narrowed it down based upon what their medium or their website is, how much personality are you looking for in those uh, in that phase. I think there's an interesting thing between personality and brand. Uh-huh. So to me, one of the interesting people that um, I always laugh is Patrick Cox mm-hmm. has his profile picture with a headband on there. Mm-hmm. And I always think that is so funny. Why does he do that? But now it's almost become his brand. I mm-hmm. don't know if it was intentional or not, but we'll say for this conversation, it was something like that almost becomes more of a brand than a, a personality. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's a difference between is your brand that you want to be playful, that you use a uh, great and anim- a uh, little illustrations in there like is that your brand or is your personality super goofy and does it come off as not serious Mm -hmm. you're not taking it too serious or Mm -hmm. too professionally Mm -hmm. um or are you like so straightforward that like it sounds like a robot did it Mm -hmm. so i think there's a difference between brand and knowing how to style versus letting your personality of the weird stuff come in yeah that's fair it's interesting because uh, if you're not paying attention, you can blur the lines real quick in those things. Yep, definitely. Um, but you can also be very intentional then in how you make your decisions. I mean, even down to like the tone of writing, Yeah. Um, the images you use or the gifts that you use, you know, whatever, like that type of stuff can really uh, get close to this, this gray area of is this brand or is this personality? Yeah. Uh, so being intentional in those decisions is important there. Well, and what's interesting is when you talk about personality and brand, a lot of people focus that either on the portfolio or the case studies. Uh-huh. But do, does the way that you speak when you come into a uh, portfolio review, for instance, does it still feel like you? Mm-hmm. Like I've read through some case studies. I'm like, wow, this person is so serious. Like, I don't know if I can handle this person. Mm-hmm. That's too serious. I need someone that's a little joking. I'll interview them anyways. Get them in the room and they're cracking jokes. They're doing sure. dad jokes just like me. I'm like, all right, this is my guy because <laughs> they're a lot like me. Uh-huh. But that doesn't always come out. And so I think to that point, like make sure that the way all of your assets come across is the same way you might behave in real life. Yeah. So I know if you're the super serious person, if you're super analytical, like let some of that come through in a way that when I meet you, I don't think it's a different person. Yeah. One thing that I don't feel like I see a lot of, and you briefly mentioned that you look for, you know, a dribble account to see the visual with so many UX designers, uh, you know, coming into the market at this point, um, I feel like I see a lot of case studies and relatively a little amount of visual design. Yep. And I think they go very heavy in like, here's the research phase of UX, but then they kind of empty out everything outside of just that research phase. Like UX is research. Yep. Um, but for a lot of the UX jobs that I've at least seen, and maybe you can speak to this as well. They do include a fair amount of UI work as well. Yep. Um, Not a lot of companies that I've seen here in Utah County have separated UX and UI into two different positions. Yeah. They kind of expect you to be able to do both. Yep. And I don't see a lot of UI in portfolios. Have you found that to be true? Oh, yeah. I mean, we see it all the time on the different Slack channels for different UX groups is someone will say, hey, I've been doing all of this research and I presented it in case studies. But every time I go into an interview, people say I don't have enough visual design. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the big flaws of what we end up um, maybe some of the director levels and above the way we've preached to these students is make sure you do all this research and then they come in and we say well where's all your visual yeah and unfortunately 
most of our jobs are going to be visual. I mean, even sometimes the way I've communicated to people I've hired is, hey, we're going to go out to talk to customers. We're going to do customer journey maps. We're going to document all this great research. And then I hire them. And the first two weeks, I have to start telling them, just crank out this UI. We just need it done real quick. Uh-huh. And they say, well, what we need to go use a, do usability testing. I said, no, it's just a little toast that pops up on the bottom with the, with the progress bar. Yeah. No testing. Just yeah. do it. And it's been tested it enough. <laughs> yeah. And so I think we've gotten to that point where people forget that they do that on a regular basis. Yeah. I don't know any design teams that don't get a request of, hey, hurry and make this PowerPoint look pretty. Mm-hmm. Or, hey, hurry and just do this modal or this, this layout because we just need it for the development team to show them how it is. Show me that work yep. because that might be 50% of your time yep. is just those quick one-off things. I mean, I spent almost all of today cleaning up PowerPoint decks so that we can go to investors. Mm-hmm. So it's our EC asking me to do this stuff. I don't, that's not my job description. I'm UX, uh-huh. right? I shouldn't be cleaning up PowerPoints, but we still need that visual to make sure. the brand look good. Sure. You want to have another tool in the tool chest, right? Yeah. Have that skill set, you know, ready to be played with. Um, I've had uh, a couple interns over the last year or so feel like they've come into the UX internship at Domo with a pretty under, pretty good understanding of UX and then not feel very confident in their UI skills. Yeah. And they feel like that's like a shameful thing. Like, <laughs> Don't think less of me. Yep. And it's just like that's okay. I mean, you've you've gone through a boot camp of some sort, or you've you spent a lot of your your own studies understanding what UX is. That's great. UI work, f- frankly, we can clean that up pretty quick. Yeah, we can work on that in yep. a very easy manner. And so I'll spend the first couple weeks. Uh, for sure, in the first week, we've got uh, five daily UI challenges that we give new interns, hmm. and. It's just for me to assess how much UI work uh, do they need to to do over the course of their internship. Yeah. Uh, is this something that we should focus on over the next couple months and not focus on meaning like take over the UX work, but should we continue to do a couple UI challenges throughout this internship or do I look at it and go like, they've got it down. We can, we can skip that, shelve that and we can move on. It's interesting. Um, and I, I do that because again, I think in what we do, uh, UI isn't completely laid out in the job description. Yeah. Um, and so they come in with a pretty good understanding of the UX process. And I just want to make sure that we've covered our bases and I don't have any concerns with UI as we move forward. So that's something that we've done that I, I found to be beneficial. Yeah. Um, and it allows us to assess things pretty quickly, but how long are those challenges? I tell them not to put it well in the first couple of days. It's interesting. Uh, because our onboarding to that demo isn't the greatest. Okay. Uh, you know, we're still trying to get them access to, you know, Box or we're trying to get them access to, you know, one of our developer instances of the product. And so yeah. some things just take a little bit longer to you know, actually come through. Uh, so the first two UI challenges, they spend about two hours uh, a day on, you know, yeah. do this one for two hours, do this one for two hours. And then the next three is just, it's an hour. <laughs> and it's nothing more than that. And really time box yourself to an hour. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I know what you could do if I let you spend eight hours on yep. this. <laughs> I want you to spend one hour on this because again, <laughs> when it comes to some of these UI tasks that we do have at Domo, yeah. it ends up being, hey, we need this developers are waiting on this. Can we crank this out real quick? Yeah. And we've got two or three hours to do that. And so it's kind of a good prep for a scenario like that. Yeah. I think that's an awesome way because how many interns come and you didn't get the full time to evaluate what they could or couldn't do. Mm -hmm. I like that. You know, and we try and see UI in the interviewing process, but again, we've we've spoken to that now already. I just, I don't see a ton of UI work. So again, action piece for those who are listening that if you're assessing your portfolio and you feel like you've got three or four case studies, I might say you've got enough case studies. Yep. Uh, Jeff's not going to read any of them anyway, so... (laughs) Don't submit any of them to me. <laughs> so if you've got three or four and you're going, should I spend time on five or six? I think uh, you should check the other spokes of your portfolio. Yeah. So you've mentioned a Dribble account uh, to showcase some of the UI work, uh, case studies. Is there anything else that you're looking for? 
So to that point, I don't think people need to have a Dribble account, but I think, is there a way that you can visually sure. show yeah. some stuff? Yeah. So for instance, one guy uh, asked me to review his portfolio a couple months ago. And the first thing I did is scan through it. And I instantly wrote back and said, I'm not reading any of this. I need you to go and clean up your icons because he had some that were this beautiful icon set that I loved. And then some of them looked really bad. And I said, as soon as I go through this, I don't feel like a designer did it. So even just being able to have a consistent uh, icons yeah. usage throughout a Medium article yeah. is a huge starting point. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a Medium article, or sorry, a Dribble account. account. But is it a simple way of you showing, again, that brand and that a designer did it? Mm-hmm. So for me, just show me that craftsmanship. Yeah. Um, I think craftsmanship goes a long way. Yeah. Like, and how many free things are there out there today? Man, I want, so one of the things I did over the last summer is I actually created a portfolio on Instagram mm-hmm. and did all my projects swiping back and forth. Yeah. And I built all of the portfolio based off of free stuff I found. Uh-huh. And then I applied to some jobs and I got a lot of phone screens. Really? All fake work. Yeah. Because I was able to download all these different icon kits, uh, different uh, flow charting yeah. things. So I think there's so many resources out there. Make sure you fill in the gaps with nicely crafted stuff. Yeah. I think that for me goes the biggest way. Yeah. Um to wrap up, I, I wanted to make sure I, I hit on this last piece. So you narrowed that yep. huge group down from 90 to 8 or 10. Yep. How did you get to, from 8 or 10 to 1? What was the big differentiator between those? Yep. So with the 10, I always do phone screens first. Okay. I want to understand, can they even communicate with me? And my favorite question is, what questions do you have for me? Uh-huh. If those questions are super weak... You're not coming in for an in-person interview. So that's really how I start narrowing it down is to find out how curious is a person. I also use that lame question everyone says, how much do you, or what do you know about Rice Point? Uh And if they say, I don't know. You haven't prepared. You haven't prepared and I'm just another applicant or another place that you applied. Yeah. So a lot of just that phone screen helps me usually get down to two or three applicants. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's four or five and then I actually bring them on, on site. And I'm not the traditional interviewer. I don't come in and say, so tell me what's the difference between UX and UI or tell me how you visually laid something out. Sure. I actually love to just have conversations. So while I'm telling them what Rise Point does, how our team works, um, how I separate our product and creative team and our UX team, I start looking, are they asking questions? What are they saying? And then I actually have them present their best project. Yeah. Just talk to me about it. I don't even want to see it up on the board yeah. until I ask you that I want to see it. And it's really interesting just to see how people can condense what they did into words. Yeah. And I, and so that really helps me get down to that one. Um, the current intern I just hired, he is really good at this is the problem I had. These are the steps I took to do it. And this was the final, the final outcome. Mm-hmm. And this is how it solved that problem. Mm-hmm. Done. That's good enough for me. Perfect. Because if that problem statement and that final don't fulfill each other, that's kind of, I mean, that's our main purpose is UX designers yeah. to solve those problems. When you ask them, uh, what questions do you have for me? Is I mean, because I'm sure you've seen a couple of different responses. One of which would be like, um... No, I think you've answered all of them. You answered them. Yep. Uh-huh. Yep. And the next one would be something very simple, like, "Well, tell me a little bit about you, what you do." Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just like, okay, uh, is there are there questions that you're hoping that they ask, or things that you're hoping they dig into? Yeah. So one of them I really love is tell me what I'd be doing on a daily basis, because I think a lot of companies do things a, a lot different. Uh-huh. So for instance, someone like Lucid just did a presentation on A B testing. My team's never done A-B testing. We're not big enough. We're not fat or we're not agile enough to do that uh, because we support a really large project, a product. So for me, if someone even asked that question, I could tell them where we might differ from others so they can even see if it's a place they want to work. 
the other thing I like them to say is how or ask is how much buy-in do you have from your executive committee? So REC loves what we do. I went to a meeting yesterday and they said, hey, can we have all these customer journey maps? They've been helping us sell better. Hmm. And I'm like, oh, crap. They're starting to ask for stuff that we don't have time to do. But now if I go to them and say, hey, give us some more money. We need to hire another person. They're already bought in, right? Yeah. But a lot of people don't ask that question. And that's a huge differentiator from job to job. Yeah. Or I love for them to say, if it's an internship, what's this internship going to include? Is it going to be me more learning about UX or is it me participating directly to the team yeah because i think some companies like to bring them along along more as a mentorship my intern the second day i threw him on a project and said this has to be done by the end of the day because we're a small enough team we have to go so i really want someone to i to understand what the environment is rather than just what the ux team does Mm -hmm. because we do everything across the board and if you're not prepared for that it might not be a fun experience for you yeah because we run super fast and crank things out we might find out tomorrow that we're going to be on a phone call with mcdonald's and people get intimidated by that we don't have time to be intimidated we just need to get on that phone call and ask sure. the right questions sure crank out the research and move on yeah so that's awesome well, i appreciate uh, all your insight here jeff yeah uh, for those who are listening if you're applying for an internship when's your next wave of internships we'll start I guess in May or sorry, the end of April is when we'll put the posting up. Okay. Yep. So that's probably going to be right about the time where this goes live. Uh, so for those who are interested in an internship at Rise Point, uh, reach out to Jeff, figure out how to get your foot in the door. And if you've listened to this podcast, you've got uh, uh, a couple insights on how to appease Jeff in that interview process. Yes. And please apply. We, we have a great internship program and you get to be right in the work right from the beginning. Cool. Well, thanks, Jeff, for coming. I very much appreciate your time. Oh, thanks. This has been awesome. This has been good. Thank you. That's it for today.